Hi, and welcome to the lecture and slideshow for module 17, where we'll be discussing the two movements called Dada and Surrealism. I have a feeling this is going to be rather a short lecture, because it because typically when I teach these, I like to do a lot of discussion. And since it's just me talking, I think I'll probably get through this fairly quickly. So today with Dada and Surrealism, we'll be talking about the aftermath of World War I and what effect it had on art. And it absolutely affected artists and the art world. The first movement, Dada, is rather anti-art, which you can see in this image that I'm showing you here on the right side, this uh, re-spin on the Mona Lisa by Marcel Duchamp. With Dada, we see the beginnings of conceptual art. Surrealism is another example of conceptual art, especially because the surrealists are very interested in exploring the subconscious. We also see a strong interest in strange juxtapositions in both of these styles as a way for the viewer to call certain things into question. These are two movements that really want to make the viewer think. So just to give you the context of this work that I'm showing you here on the right, Marcel Duchamp, one of the most prominent artists of the Dada movement, picked up a postcard of the Mona Lisa from the Louvre, drew a goatee and mustache on her, and on the bottom wrote L-H-O-O-Q, or in French that would be pronounced L H O O Q, which when said quickly sounds just about the same as the French words for she's got a hot ass. So we see Dada is playing around with tradition, especially. We'll see that with Duchamp throughout this lecture. So we'll start with Dada. Dada was an international artistic and literary movement that began during World War I in neutral Switzerland and specifically in Zurich. It was largely begun by a man named Hugo Ball, and I'm showing you a photograph of Hugo Ball here. He was a poet, musician, and theater producer. Now, Dada began largely at an establishment called the Cabaret Voltaire, and this is the site where Dada performances occurred in 1916, especially with poetry, art, performance, and music. World War I was this horrifying and devastating experience for basically everybody living in Europe. It had a profound effect on the arts, including this pervasive sense of pessimism and disillusionment with the world. Dada was a reaction to establishment and rationality and progress. Now this is something we sort of talked about with the Romantics, but we're, in, we're a whole century in the future from when Romanticism was developing, and it takes this to a completely different level. The Dada is thought that the establishment and rationality and progress were the causes of war. And again, that's very much like the Romantics. It was an international movement, so even though it began in Zurich, it spreads to Paris, Germany, and also occurs in New York. So this is an artistic development that is largely anti-art. It was a reaction against the artistic, es artistic establishment and tradition. It's not consciously an artistic movement. It did not want to be established with traditional concepts of art, so it's a very diverse movement, although there are some consistent themes throughout, including the fact that it's rather iconoclastic, so not in a very literal sense that they want to break images like what we saw before, but it's sort of breaking your idea of images. We see Dada artists and poets embracing anarchy, the irrational, and the intuitive, because the opposite of these things were what caused the war. It's often very playful and witty, and there's even an element of chance involved quite often. It's important for the development of conceptual art later in the 20th century. The name, we're not really sure where it came from. There's a lot of different stories trying to define this word Dada. Some things I've read include saying that it's a random choice from a dictionary. Even the name has this element of absurdity, chance, and nonsense, yet it's also quite whimsical. So as I said, I'm showing you this image of Hugo Ball, who is considered the founder of the Dada movement. And I'm showing you this photo where he was performing a poem that I'll play for you in just a minute called Caravane. And this photo is from the Cabaret Voltaire. It's a German poem that is meaningful because it has no Meaning. So now I want to play this for you while I show you the text. Oh, 
So that was caravane, and it has really no meaning. And again, that's why it is meaningful. And I think this is a really good example of the goals of Dada. And by goals, that is they have no goals. It's all about chance. That's an idea that is also furthered by this work that I'm showing you by the artist Jean Arp. And it's called Collage Arranged According to the Laws of Chance, dating from 1916 to 1917. Arp was a Swiss artist, and he's one of the founders of the European Dada movement. Collage was a medium embraced by Dada artists, and you can think of this as deriving from synthetic cubism. Here, the title tells you exactly what went into the process of this creation. The element of chance created the entire work. So all Arp did to make this was to tear up pieces of paper and let them fall onto another paper background. And then he pasted them where gravity had chosen for them to fall, where chance had let them rest. It's a great example of the idea of anarchy and nihilism that is present in Dada. He probably did end up arranging them just a little bit into this sort of regular grid-like pattern. It does have some sense of aesthetic to it. But for the most part, you can think of Arp standing above this piece of paper with these other pieces of paper and letting them fall and then he paste them into place. So again, this idea of chance, anarchy, that's what the Dada is thought was necessary to overcome the war because the absence of chance and the absence of anarchy had led to the terrible situation that Europe was in at that point. So it's an interesting example of some of the ideas that Dada was trying to promote. I now want to turn to Marcel Duchamp, who is probably the most famous and influential of the Dada artists. He was from a family of artists. He worked in Paris until around the beginning of World War I, and then moved to New York, where he becomes central for the avant-garde movement in New York City. He moved there to escape World War I, as did many other artists, although there's more of a flight to New York at the start of World War II. That's when the art world really changes its center from Paris to New York is this time of the wars. Duchamp in New York becomes very influential, especially in terms of artistic freedom and autonomy. So I wanted to show you this work, which is a little bit before his work as a Dada artist per se. Remember I said Dada starts around 1916. And this is his painting called Nude Descending a Staircase, number two, dating from 1912. He starts out in a somewhat cubist and futurist mode. Hopefully you can see elements of both of those in this painting. So he's breaking apart the form of the body, but you also get this real sense of movement that we saw in futurism. He exhibited this work at what's called the Armory Show, which was an exhibition in 1913 that had more than 1,200 works by American and European artists. And the point was to show American audiences the latest artistic developments. And the show in general attracted a lot of controversy, as did this piece in particular. It was a really pivotal show that happened in New York that displayed to a wide audience the avant-garde movement and as a real catalyst for a lot of the changes that occur in American art following it. So this work was not well received at the Armory Show and it perhaps was the most scandalous work of all. One critic referred to it as an explosion in a shingle factory, another called it disused golf clubs and bags, and another said an orderly heap of broken violins. So people were disparaging of it pretty considerably. 
Duchamp said the following about this painting, quote, my aim was a static representation of movement, a static composition of indications of various positions taken by a form in movement with no attempt to give cinema effects through painting. It's a really interesting way to talk about this work because obviously there's a lot of movement shown, but he's talking about how it is static. So he's trying to reconcile this stillness of a painting with the movement of a figure. It's a combination of futurist ideas with motion and speed. Your book classifies it as a humorous attack on futurism, but we see him doing that with cubist forms. It's even got the same color palette as analytic cubism. The fact that it looks like multiple images seems to also indicate the influence of photography here. Duchamp's fame really launches when he displays this work called Fountain from 1917. Now this work you can go see it at the PMA in Philadelphia, although it is it should be said that that is not the original that was shown in 1917, but I'll talk about that in just a minute. Fountain is the earliest example and one of the best examples of his works that are called ready-mades. And ready-mades are these mass-produced items selected by the artist and then placed into an artistic context. Picasso and synthetic cubism and cubist sculpture was a precursor, the notion of mass production, and also we see this challenging the traditional role of the artist as a creator. Duchamp is the one who coined this term ready-mades, and sometimes he manipulated or adjusted the object in, this, in the context of these ready-mades. So let's talk about what we're looking at here. This fountain is in fact a urinal that he purchased. He turned it on its back and then he signed it and dated it, but he signed it with a pseudonym, R. Mutt. It's a name that comes with a few different puns. One is about a famous plumbing company called the Mott Plumbing Company. The other is there was a comic strip team named Mutt and Jeff. So there's this playfulness and, and witty nature to this object. So why on earth would he do this? Why do use a, why look to mass produced objects and make them art? It challenges the notion of what constitutes art or what defines good and bad art. It also challenges the role of the artist. Can somebody be called an artist if they go to a store, purchase an object, display it in a different way and sign it. It also challenges the concept of high art. And this is something that had been a strong undercurrent in the art world for a long time, especially with the rise of the academy, which was the institution that educated artists and displayed works, but also was the arbiter of taste. Remember, think back to Manet with that. This work was rejected by artists for an unjuried show in New York City. So an unjuried show means there is nobody judging it, everything can get in, and yet this managed to get rejected. He wrote a defense of the work afterwards, explaining some important aspects of his approach. He said that he chose it, and that is what gave it its artfulness. Now, as I said, this is actually not the one he submitted to the show. Over the course of time, that work in particular became lost, and so he just bought another one and signed it in the same way. Really, the issue of originality is not a concern. He bought the first one, so buying a second one was not a problem at all. So as I said, this duplicate can be seen in the PMA. And usually in a classroom, I pose a lot of questions about this because I think it is one of the first moments where we can really question, is this art? Now, when I posed that question at the beginning of our course, what is art? A lot of you said that basically anything can be art. I don't know if you would be saying that if it weren't for Duchamp and his ready-mates, because this is in an art museum today. It is taught in every art history class that is a survey class like this that covers a wide range of time. There's something to be said about being first, about having this original idea of taking an object and declaring it art because you're an artist. And there's just a lot of really interesting issues to consider about the notion of high versus low art. How do we decide what venue is appropriate for a particular type of art? And that can lead to questions about arts versus crafts or indigenous arts versus European arts. Anytime you go to an art museum, you see them making particular choices. 
You often don't have fiber arts displayed unless they're very fancy old tapestries. You often see indigenous arts displayed in the basement or in other hard to access rooms. It's really interesting the choices the art museums are still making, not really grappling with these questions. They're not even thinking about them. We just have these ingrained ideas about art sometimes. So Duchamp is extremely important for the history of art. And like with Picasso before him and Manet before him, I don't think the art world would be where it is today without him. Duchamp produces a lot of these ready-mades, and if you just do some searching online, you'll find all sorts of things that he made. A bicycle wheel is a very famous one where he mounts a bicycle wheel on top of a stool. One of my favorites is he has a ready-made that's a snow shovel, but he gives it a brilliant title. It's called In Advance of a Broken Arm. So they're talking about the eventual outcome if you're using it in its functional capacity. Now, Duchamp ends up retiring from art at quite a young age so that he can play chess all the time. And that seems very fitting, I think. So now I'd like to talk about surrealism and we'll look at a few different works in this vein. Surrealism develops in the 1920s and many formerly Dada artists start working in this vein. So surrealism is an artistic movement that explored ways to express in art the world of dreams and the subconscious and was begun by a writer named André Breton. He set out to harness the ideas of Dada, but in a more programmatic fashion, so a little less chance, although there is a lot of chance involved here as well. The Surrealists believed that dreams and the subconscious was where all humans could connect and where they could be free from societal constrictions. This is largely inspired by the ideas of Sigmund Freud and Jung, and especially their interest in the nature of dreams and psychoanalysis. They introduce new techniques to access the subconscious, and they draw upon techniques employed by Dada artists as well. So they incorporate Dada artistic techniques, including the element of chance or things being beyond the usual or spontaneous. They also use something called automatism. And what this means is a generic term referring to a variety of manual techniques employed by the surrealist painters to create new forms without conscious control. Now, often people will ask if artists like Salvador Dali, who's painting The Persistence of Memory we're looking at here, will ask if he was on drugs. Now, some of the surrealists did use drugs, but there were many of them who really discouraged it. They thought that was not the proper way to tap into the subconscious. They had more like hypnotic effects or things called automatic writing where they would sort of put themselves into a meditative trance and then write and see what they produced. So like Dada, Surrealism is also a literary movement. So let's talk about this painting from 1931 and about Dali. He's probably the most famous Surrealist, and in his paintings we often see a type of hyper-realism. He studies Freud, and in this painting we see some consistency with themes of sex and death that is often found in Freudian psychology. He used something called the paranoiac critical method, and that meant that he would work himself up into a paranoid frenzy in order to see things differently than through conventional methods. So in this painting we have a, a pretty typical scene of Dali. To me his works are pretty easy to identify as being by him. You have this eerie setting, a rather barren landscape, and then he incorporates some nonsensical and absurd elements. So we see these clocks that seem to be melting. You see the stopwatch over on the bottom left side as well. And you've got this barren tree that kind of gives this sense of foreboding. And thinking about it, it actually reminds me of the tree in Giotto's Lamentation from the Arena Chapel. It's not being used in quite the same way compositionally, but that barren tree is this motif that could represent ideas of death or just time passing. These melting clocks have now become something you see in like trinket shops and junk shops. And so I think it has lost some of its potency in a way because if something's reproduced so many times it becomes almost meaningless but i mean think about what this might mean why is time melting in in this way well one interpretation has been that the limp watches and clocks 
reflect fears of sexual impotence. We also know that the swarming ants on the stopwatch down there are reflecting a childhood experience in which Dali saw ants consuming a dead animal, but now it's consuming this emblem of time. Then you also see this very strange shape lying on the ground in the center. It's a sort of amorphous creature, but then if you start looking at it, it seems to have a face. We've got this large closed eye with long eyelashes. This nose, is it a tongue sticking out? It's not really clear, but just like the clocks, it's sort of melting into its surroundings. You've got this series of rectangular blocks here on the left with the tree growing out of a wooden block, and then in the background as well, almost looking out over this ocean scape in the background. We see a lot of dead, barren, and lifeless elements. The only things that aren't lifeless are the bugs, the ants crawling all over it, and then that single fly posed on the largest of these melting clocks. Again, his style is meticulously realistic, and I think that's one reason that these have almost a jarring effect. They seem so real, and yet the elements are rather absurd. Now, this work is quite small, but many of his works are quite monumental. So his works are really arresting, I think, and often I describe these to my students as what I imagine my nightmares would look like if they were brought to life, but I know a lot of people like Dali. I just fear looking at him for too long, but that is me being silly. I also want to talk about the painter named Rene Magritte, and here I'm showing you my favorite work by him. It's such a disappointment to me that your book doesn't reproduce this one. Magritte is a Belgian painter, and like Dali, he's interested in veristic images, so this sort of hyper-realism in his images. He's also very interested in dissolving image and meaning. His works are meant to be shocks to the viewer's system, subverting expectations, and often also subverting common sense. He's trying to make you see that there's a danger in relying on logic when dealing with images, because they're just images. The title of this gives away his point that images are deceiving and we shouldn't be deceived by them. So this is called The Treachery of Images, and it dates 1928 to 29. And so what we see is this large pipe occupying most of the space of this painting. And then down below, written on it, it says, Ceci n'est pas un pipe, which in French means, this is not a pipe. So what does that mean? Why would he write this? This complete sentence it even has a period. Why would he write that just below a pipe? Hopefully what you're thinking to yourself is that this is a painting of a pipe. It is not actually a pipe. And so that is how images can be deceiving. That's one reason that he's so careful in his rendering of the image. And this juxtaposition of text with image hampers the illusion. Remember, we talked about that a bit with cubism, how if you have stenciling on the surface, letters or numbers, they jump to the, pl the front plane of the image, they flatten it out, they remind you of the two-dimensionality of a page or a flat painting. So even though he's modeled this, he's put nice lighting effects on the pipe to make it look three-dimensional, the words will not let you forget that this is just a painting. It's only a two-dimensional canvas support with some paint on it. That's it. The work that your book chooses to illustrate by Magritte is this work called Time Transfixed, or in French, La Dure Poignardée from 1938. And I've noticed that I've misspelled transfixed in this slide. My apologies for that. So this is a really good example of his work in general, rather than the text and image juxtaposition of the treachery of images. He keeps the surfaces of his paintings very smooth and clean. So with this, he makes it this window, this super realism, sort of the same ideas of the naturalism we saw in the Renaissance, this recreation of space to pull the viewer in. Here it's meant to sort of stop the viewer because the juxtapositions that he employs show that even though it looks realistic, it isn't, or that it's from some kind of dream world. This is a really good example of that because it's a seemingly normal looking living room. It's centered on a fireplace and a mantle that has a mirror posed above, a clock, and then two empty candlesticks. So inside this fireplace is another common object, but placed in this context, it doesn't make any sense. So this train is emerging from nowhere. 
out of the fireplace. Its position and its scale just make it look nonsensical. The room is completely empty of human life. The objects are carefully selected, which seem to describe time. The clock is set at a particular hour. Those candlesticks are empty. The empty space of the walls around it and the fact that there is nothing reflected in that mirror except for one candlestick and that clock. It just seems so empty. There's no break in the wall behind the train indicating where it came from. And yet it mysteriously casts a shadow but we don't really have a sense of a light source at all. The smoke of the train indicates that it's moving, but that smoke magically disappears up the chimney, which is a nice sort of joke towards the functionality of a fireplace. So in French, I wanted to include the French title because I wanted to talk about its literal translation. La durée poignardée literally means time stabbed, as in with a dagger or a sword. So you can sort of read that the train is that dagger through time in this painting, that it just doesn't make any sense, that it is, it's the effect that Magritte's images have. They just sort of stop everything you're doing, and then you try to make sense of them. So this is a really good example of the goals of the Surrealists, make you question these ideas, or are we looking at a dream world? The last Surrealist I wanted to talk about today is Juan Miro. And this is his painting called Spanish Dancer from 1945. Now, the supplementary reading today from Miro gives you a good sense of how he worked. That is, with little regard for planning his works out. He would often start out with no plan, but then he would see how those ideas would develop. So Miro is Spanish, but he works in many different centers because, as your reading indicated, he's sort of running away from the war. He relocates to Palma de Mallorca for a while, to Barcelona. He's moving to try to escape the war and focus on his painting. His work is characterized by abstracted forms, and they often feature sort of biomorphic shapes and the use of primary colors. In a lot of ways, they almost seem childlike. We know he also used the automatic method sometimes where he would work himself into some kind of state and then just start out with not much of a plan and then that's when he would go back and finish with a plan in mind based on what developed based on this chance access of the subconscious. So the title he gives us here makes us want to look for this dancer, the Spanish dancer, but where is she? Now your book is interesting about this. I don't know that I agree completely with what your book says. So at the top Yes, you can sort of make out a head, I think. You've got two eyes, but one is sort of melting down the face a bit. And then on the left side of this head, maybe you can argue for a nose and a mouth. It seems so much derived from chance that it's hard to really categorize it as this, but Miro wants us to see that. And then I suppose you could argue that this is a torso here, that she's got an arm lifted up in the air and a or a leg kicking up, or maybe this is both legs, but then what is she resting on? It's, it's kind of confusing. So it's not straightforward or clear. You have to know the title that the artist has given it. So it's, it's leading even more towards abstraction than what we've seen before with cubism. As I said, it's sort of an automatic painting because Miro was also interested in the automatic writing of Surrealist. So he's largely a painter, but he also does some writing. And Miro, maybe more so than Magritte or Dali, has a strong interest in line and form. And he likes to suggest a subject in a very different way than the hyper-realist works of Dali and Magritte. So, but, he's, but we see him more interested in patterning and effects, trying to capture rhythm in a static image. So surrealism is not really a very unified style. Instead, you've got artists who are working with similar methods. And really, this can be said about a lot of those, these modernist movements that we'll be looking at. And we'll see that continue to be the case. Everybody's a little bit different. After Cubism, everything just sort of explodes into, I don't want to call it a free-for-all per se, that's maybe a little uncharitable. But we see artists experimenting in completely new modes and styles, rejecting what came before, but often they're not rejecting it as much as they would want us to believe. And that's something that you'll be discussing with your further 
requirements for this module. So I just wanted to show you this juxtaposition to remind you that we are only 80 years difference between these two works. On the right, we're looking at Degas' Dancer with a Bouquet Bowing. So we have the similar subject between the two scenes, but a really different strategy of representation. We see with the Impressionists and Degas this, that they still have this interest in creating an illusionistic space, whereas Miro's style is really flat. It's very much at the surface. There's no real indication of space, even though it's supposed to be a reminder of a human form. It's hard to find many similarities between these works ex except for the subject because surrealism is just so far removed from impressionism. Before we would have talked about 80 years about not much changing, but you can see that in the 19th and 20th century, the artistic styles are changing rapidly, styles are progressing, and artists have new goals with their works that hadn't been the goals of earlier artists. In a lot of ways, art starts to become more philosophical, and I think that's true of contemporary art today as well. There's a lot to be said about the ideas of the artist, and the viewer can't rely on illusionism to make sense of the painting necessarily. That's not what these artists are trying to do. Today, talking about Dada and surrealism, we focused on the aftermath of World War I and how drastic an effect it had on art, the trauma of the war, the irrationality of how many millions of people died really affected artists with a sense of pessimism and just looking towards overthrowing everything that had taken place before. So with Dada, we see an art movement that is anti-art and anti-establishment. With Dada, we really see the beginnings of conceptual art, the importance of the artist's idea, even more so than with somebody like the Fauves, who are so interested in expressing the artist's emotion. With surrealism, we see this deep exploration of the subconscious, this interest in the writings of Freud and Jung, looking at psychology as a way to explore new types of images. And we also talked about the strange juxtapositions with somebody like Magritte, who in a lot of ways is like Dada, trying to make you question art, make you question the rationality of images. So to finish Module 17, we'll need to take the self-assessment, there is a, there's a discussion board prompt you'll find on Blackboard, as well as a prompt for journal number nine. And today's vocabulary wiki is the responsibility of group one. So thank you for listening, and I will see you for module 18.